E. Good evening, everyone. Do take a seat. As John said, we are picking up our studies in Mark's Gospel that we left off. Was it before Christmas? Feels like a while ago, but uh, we're picking up at chapter 11. So I'll read Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. That's on page 847 of these church Bibles. Often this is the point at which I would lead us in prayer, asking for God's help. I think Seb did that brilliantly a, a short while ago and covered everything. We do hope and pray that this is a passage in which we will see the majesty of Jesus our King. And so I'll add a hearty amen to what Seb prayed. And I'll read from verses 1 to 11 of Mark chapter 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they said to them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I was just about to embark on my final ETS, seminary exams. And so at the time, I was quite glad to have a fairly light preaching schedule to focus on my studies, but I find myself tonight having completed exams, slightly rueful that I wasn't preaching on this passage about three or four weeks ago. Because if I had been preaching on this passage on the 7th of May, many of us would have just spent the previous day watching extended coverage of the procession of a king. Uh, I don't know if you're a diehard royalist or a diehard Republican, uh, but however your political allegiances lie, if you caught any of the coverage of Charles's coronation a few weeks ago, you can't deny that the whole thing was pretty majestic. You can say what you like about the UK, but I think we do pomp and ceremony pretty well. If you watched any of the coverage, you would have seen many members of the armed services in all their full regalia marching to one beat along the streets of London. That you'd have seen the king walking into Westminster Abbey, resplendent in his robes with a crown being laid on his head and Zadok the priest rising as the choirs sang it as he was crowned. It was a truly awe-inspiring a majestic day, or for some of us, maybe a colossal waste of money that we'd rather hadn't happened. But let's just go with the majesty, if you'll, if you'll bear with me. And I wonder if you think of the majesty of that day and the procession of that king, can you spot the difference with Mark chapter 11? Yes, there are some similarities uh, on both occasions. The crowds were very happy to see the king. But here in Mark chapter 11, at the heart of this procession, we of course find not a king robed in resplendent glory and riding in an air-conditioned stagecoach with electric windows, the BBC commentary told me. No, instead we find a simple, a humble king riding on a donkey. As we pick up Mark's gospel here at chapter 11, we're reminded of something that actually we've seen at every stage in Mark's gospel so far. If you're with us for any of that, you'll know 
that at every stage we see in Mark's gospel that Jesus is the king, the true king sent from God, the king with authority. And that theme of Jesus' kingship, his kingly authority is picked up and expanded upon once more in chapters 11 to 13. We enter into now the story of the last week of Jesus' life and earthly ministry before his death and resurrection. And because in these chapters, Mark is tying together a lot of the things that we've already seen about Jesus' kingly authority, about how he's the king who judges and the king who saves, as we embark on these next few weeks, we should expect to recognize more the kind of king Jesus is, and we should expect to respond to our king, sometimes in awestruck thankfulness, and sometimes with deep and sober humility. We'll see both of those things, both of those reactions are appropriate in our passage tonight as we look at our king together. There are three elements of Jesus' kingship that we'll focus on in this passage. He's the king with authority, he's the king who was promised, and Jesus is the king who judges. Those are our three headings. You'll see they're on the sheet you were given on your way in. They'll appear on the screen. So first of all, Jesus is the king with authority. And his authority is displayed here in maybe more subtle ways than we've seen before, but in no less real ones. First of all, notice the command and obedience that goes on. It's one of those blink and you'll miss it kind of details in this passage, but which nonetheless points us towards Jesus' kingly authority. Now, if you've been with us for previous sections of Mark that we've looked at, you might know that Jesus has up to this point displayed his authority before. Just think of the man with the legion of demons restored to his right mind. Just think of the furious storm at sea calmed with a word. Just think of Jairus' daughter raised from her deathbed to life. What we see here is maybe not quite as dramatic as any of those examples, but it's a demonstration nonetheless of Jesus' authority. Mark is a very fast-paced gospel. Uh, I remember giving it to one of my English literature student friends in my first year of uni. He read through it. He said, well, this is a rubbish book because it just says this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. There's no drama. There's no kind of narrative links. And from a literary point of view, maybe he was right. But that's kind of the point in Mark. It's so fast-paced. And yet here, in this last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, the pace slows right down. And we linger over little details like how he went into Jerusalem, where his disciples found his mode of transport. When Mark's gospel slows down, we're meant to take notice. And so just look at how some of the things that Jesus instructs and commands come to be without any question. Verse 2, he says, go into the village. Verse 4, and they went. Verse 3, say the Lord has need of it. Verse 6, they told him what Jesus had said. Verse 2, bring it to me. Verse 7, and they brought it. It's simple and it's subtle. But here we see Jesus is a king with authority to command and whose commands are met with obedience. It was a few years ago I saw an interview with Tony Blair, the ex-prime minister. He was saying that when you get into office, you think, well, I'm the prime minister of the country. When I say things, things are going to happen. My words have meaning. I'll be able to tell people to do things, and they'll be done. And you soon find out that that's not quite how it works. And actually, getting anything done in Westminster takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. Well, that's not the kind of ruler that Jesus is. It might be a small and subtle picture, but it's still a picture of how, when he commands things, they happen. We also see a note, though, as well, of, as well as command and obedience, we see prediction and fulfillment. Similarly, as Jesus commands things and they happen, as he predicts things, they unfold. Verse 2, you'll find a colt tied. Verse 4, they went away and found a colt tied. Verse 3, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Verse 5, some of those standing there said, what are you doing? Again, it's not the most dramatic fulfillment of prophecy, 
but these things do give the reader confidence, or in fact designed to give the reader confidence, that other prophecies that Jesus has made will come to pass just as surely as these ones. Let's just think about that for a second. Here we are entering Jerusalem in verse 1, just outside, near to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place which, about which not very long before this episode, Jesus has just said to his followers, Mark 10, 33, see, we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him and after three days he will rise. In a very real sense, throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus has been on the road to Jerusalem the whole time. The verses I've just read, that's the last of Jesus' three explicit predictions about his death, which he makes between chapters 8 and 10. But the road to Jerusalem runs right through all of Mark's gospel. It's there all the way back in chapter 1 when Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's there as he bids people to come and follow him. It's there in his displaying his power through dramatic miracles. It's there in his confronting of the religious elites of the day. In all of these things, Jesus has been foreshadowing the work that God is doing, which will reach its first fulfillment on a Roman cross about a week after our passage tonight is set. Jesus knows this. And as he goes into Jerusalem, he is under no illusions. And he's under nobody's power, nobody's authority, but his own God-given power and authority. It is not reluctantly or weakly with a sense of helpless foreboding that he goes into the place of his death. It is not full of confidence and triumph and about to be taken by surprise that he goes into the place of his death. No, even these small details in this passage combine to build up a picture of someone who is in complete control. We were thinking about that this morning with David preaching on John 18. As Jesus goes to his death, he is the picture of a man in control of everything. I will know that history is full of stories of noble sacrifice, which, which we rightly venerate when we hear them. We might think of uh, Captain Scott and Captain Oates. Captain Oates' famous last words, I'm just going out for a walk, I may be some time, as he made the sacrifice of walking out into the Arctic colds in order to give the rest of his expedition the best chance of survival. I think of stories that I read in the Titanic Museum in Belfast of when the ship was sinking, there were certain men who decided to, rather than panic, very calmly get dressed into their evening wear and escort women and children to the few lifeboat spaces and await their own icy fate. Anytime we read stories like that, I think we're rightly humbled, we're rightly inspired by acts of nobility and bravery in the face of mortal danger. We're, we're drawn to think, how would I react in a situation like that? And if we're humbled by those human examples, how much more should we be humbled by Jesus? Jesus, the King of all, the blameless one, Jesus who walks on water, Jesus who wakes little girls from death's sleep, Jesus who demonstrates his kingly authority once again by calmly, steadfastly setting his eyes on the cross and going there not as a helpless victim, but as a king with authority. Completely willingly, completely concerned with God's glory, 
completely committed to winning for his father a people made right through his death, which pays the price for our sin and rejection of God. Yes, it's humbling that Jesus is so steadfast in going to his death for our sake. It's also deeply reassuring. There will be times when we suspect in the Christian life that God might not be for us because of my ongoing sin, because of my circumstances in life, we will feel as though maybe we've got something wrong. Maybe God doesn't really love me, isn't really for me. And in those moments, we can look to the composed, controlled Jesus continuing his march to Jerusalem. His death for us was no accident. It wasn't a mistake which God put right. It was something entirely within Jesus' control and entirely part of God's plan. As well as being humbled by that, I wonder if we should be chastened by it too. We speak a lot about grace in this church. It's one of the things I love about our church. We know and we love the gospel. We know about God's grace and we love it. But if there's no other king who saves but Jesus alone, if there's no other would-be savior who would march so resolutely towards laying down their lives for us, That can humble us in our tendencies to think that that we can somehow add something to that. It reminds us that we are entirely reliant on the deliverance of Jesus, our King. And it also chastens us when, because of our such big view of God's grace, we can sometimes subtly begin to think, I know I can, but maybe my sin isn't that big a deal. If it took the death of our glorious king to deliver me, to deliver us from sin's clutches, then there's a chastening note here of the times that I'm tempted, when we are tempted, to forget sin severity. There is a confronting and humbling note then in this entry into Jerusalem. And we'll see that unfold a bit more as we learn more about our king. Next, how Jesus is the king who was promised. And another reason why the action slows down around this entry into Jerusalem is to highlight how Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The details that Mark records, they're not random. If you remember the reading that Becca brought to us earlier from Zechariah, you'll remember words which point people towards a day when God's promised king would come. Zechariah writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion, Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Imagine we'd walked the five coastal path all the way from King Cardin to St. Andrews, and we got to King's Barns, and I decided that at that point, uh, I wanted you to go on ahead into St. Andrews, find me a taxi, bring it back, and drive the last stretch. You might rightly think, We've come this far. Can you not sort yourself out and walk the last few miles into St. Andrews? You'd probably be right to point, out, to point that out. Well, similarly, Jesus has had a very long walk to Jerusalem. When he says, therefore, that he has need of a cult, it's not because he's got a bit tired. It's because he is acutely aware of all that he's going to do and all he is going to fulfill when he gets to Jerusalem. It is Jesus' way of saying, here I am, the king that Zechariah promised was coming, it's me. That's why he has need of a cult to demonstrate once again that he really is God's long-promised king. And those Zechariah verses, they they help us to see that this entry into Jerusalem is therefore telling us a lot about the kind of king that Jesus is. First of all, maybe most obviously, he's a humble king. 
He's not riding a war horse. He's not riding in a, a state carriage. He's riding a donkey, a humble old little colt. That must have confounded expectations when Zechariah first wrote down his prophecy. People must have been surprised to hear God's king, God's glorious king, is going to ride a colt. Well, surely it's consistent with everything we've seen of Jesus so far, of infinite majesty and yet of complete humility. So even though Jesus looks meek, he looks maybe like an unlikely warrior, he's also a king who saves. We see that in the Zechariah prophecy too, a king who is coming specifically to save God's people, to bring about their deliverance from enemies. This humble king, riding on a plain old donkey, is also somehow the one who is inextricably linked with the God of the universe and his plan to save and to deliver his people and demonstrate his power and might in the face of the powers of the world. Interestingly, though, that prophecy that God's king will save, it's not just spoken about in militaristic terms. We're seeing here that Jesus is also a king who brings peace. Any decent king is meant to keep the peace. There's a medieval term, uh, breaking the king's peace. If you break the law, you're said to break the king's peace. Sometimes we still talk about that today. Rulers are are generally meant to ensure the safety and well-being of their people. Well, Zechariah tells us Jesus is a king who speaks peace to the nations. This coming into Jerusalem is a work of bringing peace, not just to his own people, but to everybody who will put their trust in him. Even the people out there who are traditionally the enemies of God's people. Even us sitting here this evening. If that's what he's come to do, come to save and to deliver and to bring peace, Well, then I think we can understand why the crowds are quite so excited to see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. They will have known much more intuitively than we do what the imagery of somebody riding a colt means. They will have known the king is here. This is the one who will save. This is the one who will deliver. This is the king who will bring peace. And they'll also have known that he is a king from David's line. See, just as Zechariah tells his readers to rejoice, so the people rejoice at the arrival of Jesus. I know that some of you recently endured a couple of broken nights sleep and a long stand in the rain to see the king proceeding past you in London and get a couple of Instagram photos But I imagine that not even the most diehard of royalists among us would think to lay down a cloak on the mall to let the king walk over it. But in a sign of jubilant homage, that's just what the people do here. There's another Old Testament echo in this. It goes back to 2 Kings chapter 9. It's symbolically saying when, when God's anointed king rides into Jerusalem, the dust of the ground is not good enough. He deserves a red carpet of our cloaks and branches if necessary. That's what the people did in 2 Kings. It's what the people do in echo of that in Mark 11. And so what they say is entirely appropriate to Hosanna, save. They quote Psalm 118, a psalm all about God's gracious and saving acts and the certainty of their fulfillment and the right response of worship and praise. And because that's what Psalm 118 is about, that's a psalm that people would traditionally sing yearly on their way up to Jerusalem. Here they're singing it though, not in the abstract. They're singing it and saying, this is all about this king they seem to be pretty certain at this point that all of these things are different ways of saying this man, this Jesus, he is the king we've been promised, the king in David's line, the king sent from the Lord 
who will save us. I don't think we have any reason to suppose that it's specifically these people who just a few days later turn on Jesus and cry out for his murder. After all, they seem genuinely excited and full of joy here. But I think it is true to say that their excitement must be misplaced. Do they really understand the full implications of what they're saying? By this point in Mark's gospel, we've seen that even his closest followers don't quite understand who Jesus is and what he's come to do. So it's unlikely that the crowds would have. No, it's more likely that they thought Jesus had come as a more traditional conquering king to overthrow the Romans, to turn over the authorities of the day. But this evening, we are in a much more privileged position than they are. Because we can see exactly the significance of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And so as we read of their reaction of excited and jubilant praise, surely one that we can learn from and echo all the more truly and fully. Here is Jesus. Jesus, our King who saves. Jesus, our King who brings peace. The fulfillment of all of God's promises to restore. And to come back to what we said earlier, the fulfillment of his promises to speak peace to and to draw in the nations. We should take profound confidence in the Christian life, knowing that our King Jesus has secured for us peace with God. Especially at those times when we're acutely aware of our own shortcomings, the ups and downs of the ongoing battle with Satan, we can remember that the decisive victory in the war has been won for us as we gaze at our conquering king who assures me that where there was enmity with God, there is now peace. Where I was a stranger, I've now been brought near. Where I was an alien, I am now a friend. The God who I was born rejecting and rebelling against is now one that I am at peace with because of the gracious work of his saving king. That gives us great confidence in the Christian life, and it gives us great impetus to walk, therefore, all the more in obedience to our king, praising him for all that he has done. And what could remind me more potently to cling to this king and no other thing than knowing that he alone is the one who has brought me peace with God. We've seen a bit of this throughout Mark's gospel as well, and we'll see it again over these next few passages. Jesus exposing the emptiness of man-made religion, exposing the hypocrisy of the religious elites of the day, exposing the futility of trusting in self or adding to or taking away from God's law. Again, if it took the coming, the death, and the resurrection of the promised and foreshadowed king, why would I look anywhere else for salvation? Why would I rely on any other thing apart from on him and on his work? So to that end, this passage really ought to inspire confidence and awe in our king, and it should also sound a slight note of warning. Because the king with authority, the king who was promised, is also the king who judges. The last couple of verses, verse 11, And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Does it feel like a bit of an anticlimax? I think it's meant to. We could maybe imagine being one of the people who lined the the streets that day. You get home that evening to your family. What did you get up to? Well, you know, actually, earlier I went into town and I actually saw God's promised chosen king who will save and deliver us riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. You know, the guy Zachariah prophesied about. I saw him. Well, that's amazing. What did he do? Well, he got into Jerusalem. 
He looked around the temple, and then he went out and checked into his hotel. Maybe he feels slightly anticlimactic. I take it that Mark is confounding their expectations of what kind of king Jesus is. I take it Jesus is confounding the expectations of the crowd. Because we all know in a way that they didn't fully grasp that the, the victory, the peace that he's come to bring, they're the victory over sin and death and peace with God, all won at the cross. So there's no call to arms, no storming of Roman strongholds. We know that. Their expectations would have been confounded. But I wonder if our expectations are slightly confounded even in this familiar passage. What kind of king do we expect Jesus to be? I said earlier, we of course know Jesus is a gracious and merciful and kind king. Praise God that he is. We see really clearly though in Mark chapters 11 to 13, Jesus is also the king of searingly accurate and incisive judgment. If Jesus to us is only ever gentle and humble Jesus. Only ever Jesus, my buddy. Well, we'll have our expectations confounded in these chapters as well. I wonder if we can imagine a classroom with no teacher. The kids are going crazy. Pictures have been drawn on the whiteboard. Paper balls are being thrown around the room. You know the kind of scene. And amidst this chaos, opens the door and in walks the headmaster. Silence falls around the room. There's nervous energy. Everybody is just waiting for the hairdryer treatment to begin and detentions to be dished out. But instead, the headmaster proceeds to walk around the room and with that kind of icily blank stare that only teachers seem to have. Just look at every single child in the class, nod to himself, and walk out of the room. I once saw something like that happen in my school days. And I can tell you it did not feel anticlimactic then. And I wonder if we should view this final verse in a similar way. Here is God's king coming, God's king with supreme authority, God's king with power to save, God's king who sees. In surveying the temple, Jesus is surveying everything that's wrong with the old Israel, seeing in detail how their leaders aren't leading, how their worship is half-hearted, how their hearts are chasing after man-made things and far from where God would have them. Jesus sees all that, and as we'll see next week, he pulls no punches as he begins to pronounce judgments on all of those things. We have seen this, this evening that Jesus is humble, but he is far from meek. It's actually really good news that Jesus exposes the emptiness of man-made religion, exposes the futility of anything that serves as more of a spiritual crutch than of actually being valuable and bringing us close to God. But though we are in a very different position from the leaders of old Israel, as we love Jesus in a way that they despise and rejected him, we are being drawn here to consider over these next few passages whether there's anything being exposed in our hearts which chases after things other than our true king. It's helpful to reflect then on areas where our trust may be misplaced. Maybe you've come to us this evening as someone who's not yet trusting in Jesus as your king, maybe with no awareness of anything that we've done in Mark so far. I'd love to chat to you afterwards if that's the case. Well, I said earlier that the central claim of Christianity is that it took the death of the king of the universe to solve the problem of your sin. That is a big claim, 
but it's one I'd urge you to look much more closely at. If that's true, it has profound implications for all of our lives. Then those of us who do know and who do love Jesus, who know the peace with God that he's won for us, even we are drawn to consider in this passage are the ways in which actually our hearts latch on subtly to other things. It's easy to have a Jesus plus approach, to subtly drift into our own observations of traditions or rituals and think that they are the things which make us right with God and therefore to base our performance on them and to judge others who don't meet our criteria. It's even easy to subtly think that as long as I feel okay, everything must be okay as if the Christian life begins and ends with our own sense of whether we're doing okay or whether we're in the right with God or not. We'll think a lot more about these things in the weeks ahead, exactly what it means for us to read Jesus observing and judging old Israel and reflect on it for ourselves. But just to lay the groundwork a little bit for that, there's a double-edged sword here in this passage. Jesus alone is the king who has power to save. And so we need to make sure that it is really, truly him alone that we are trusting in and walking with. There is no other king who saves. There is no other thing which can do what Jesus did. No other gospel which centers around the king of glory walking resolutely to a Roman cross for our sakes. There's a humbling aspect to that, a convicting and challenging one. But the other edge of the sword as we close is that that fact draws us to give thanks that we can trust in Jesus alone. Even where the Lord graciously exposes areas of our feeling, areas of our lack of trust, we can give thanks that his mercy is more than all these things. And decisively, the war has been won by his king who brings peace. Because of the work of our king then, let's pray together to God and ask for his help to apply these things. God our Father, we thank you that Jesus really is the king We thank you that we've seen time and again in this gospel that he's the king with authority. He's the king you promised, the king who saves and brings us peace with you. And we thank you that he's the king who judges and exposes anything which is not according to your will. We pray that as you reveal some of those tendencies in our hearts, you would draw us to right repentance. And we pray you would send us out confident and keeping our confidence only in Jesus, your promised king who saves. We pray that all the glory would go to him this evening as we go into the week ahead and all the days of our lives. So it's in the name of Jesus we ask and pray. Amen. Jesus is the king.